I actually grew up in Maine. I grew up not very far from here um, on the outskirts of Augusta. And I grew up on a small little dirt end road um, that was surrounded by trees and, and lots of seasonal ponds. Um, and so much of my childhood was spent just kind of roaming the woods around my house and looking for frogs and trying to spot birds and collecting things like pine cones, leaves, and flowers. And while I certainly didn't recognize it at the time, in retrospect, these activities really kind of instilled in me a real appreciation for the biodiversity in our state as well as across our planet. Um, as well as a real genuine interest in where all of this variation, this variation in organismal form and function, where all this variation comes from in the first place. And so as a geneticist now, um, I understand that uh, differences in our genetic code, uh, in our genomes, uh, genetic differences between species and between organisms, that these genetic differences in turn underpin the variation that we see in the natural world. But if we think about this, this really just kind of moves the question back a level, right? So, okay, so genetic differences um, can encode for differences in, in uh, biodiversity across the globe, but where do those genetic differences themselves actually come from? And this is the biological question that really kind of continues to, to pique my curiosity and that drives my, my research program at the Jackson Lab. So genetic diversity arises in the context of uh, genetic transmission, so the, the transmission of chromosomes from one generation to the next. And probably the first lesson you all learn in your uh, genetics coursework is that we all get one copy of every chromosome in our genome from our mom and one copy from our dad. Um, and here, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just showing you um, one of the 23 pairs of chromosomes that uh, collectively comprise the human genome. So, this is absolutely true, um, but what I want to just convey to you in the, the next several minutes is the fact that this very simple model of inheritance um, belies a lot of complexity. So for one, um, each of our parents inherited one copy of each of their chromosomes from each of their two parents. Um, and this general uh, paradigm extends backward generation by generation to the very dawn of, of humans. So as a result, uh, each copy of a given chromosome in each of your parents is genetically distinct. And what's more, the copy of the particular chromosome that gets transmitted from each of your parents is actually kind of this hybrid mosaic of the two chromosomes in their genome. And this is because during the process of egg formation in females or sperm formation in males, this genetic process called recombination takes place. And so the two copies of those chromosomes get scrambled together. And so as a result, the particular copy that gets transmitted by an individual is actually this kind of hybrid mosaic of the two chromosomes in their genome. And what's more, new mutations accumulate at every generation. Um, and these new mutations basically pepper the length of these recombined chromosomes. So as a result, um, every egg inside a woman's ovaries contains a single copy of every chromosome in the genome. And this single chromosome copy has undergone recombination and has accumulated a smattering of new mutations on top. So as a result of the kind of inherent randomness in both the mutation and the recombination process, this ensures that every egg in a woman is genetically unique. And the same goes for males as well. So a single copy of every chromosome in the genome gets packaged up into every sperm cell. And as a result of mutation and recombination, every sperm cell is genetically unique. So an egg and sperm then fuse in the context of reproduction. Uh, these processes help to ensure that every individual is genetically unique. Um, and so every uh, individual, uh, even individuals that have the same parents, have distinct genomes. So these two processes, mutation and recombination, um, uh, account for all of the genetic variation that we see within populations. And this includes genetic variation that's associated with outwardly discernible differences among individuals, so differences in, in individuals' traits. Uh, and so this includes differences that we can see with the naked eye, things like coat color variation among different house mice or hair color variation among humans, but it also includes differences that are a little more subtle, things that we can't really observe outwardly, things like differences in disease susceptibility um, and disease status among different uh, individuals. So these different strains of mice shown up here all differ in their relative susceptibility to several different diseases. Uh, and we know that these differences in their disease susceptibility in turn trace to uh, underlying differences in their genomes. 
And in turn, those differences in their genomes initially arose as the consequence of mutational events uh, that were subsequently shuffled about by this process of genetic recombination. So mutation and recombination, too, also provide the sources of diversity that serve as the substrates for adaptive evolution. And on the time scale of, of many millions of years, these processes, in turn, um, account for the full scope of biodiversity that we see on our planet. So the, the mechanisms that govern inheritance, mutation and recombination, are, are actually even more complicated than I've already alluded to. And this is because these processes are themselves incredibly variable. So mutation and recombination vary between species. Um, for example, the mutation rate in humans is roughly twice the mutation rate in mice. Similarly, there's roughly a, a two-fold difference in the frequency of recombination, the frequency of genetic exchange between chromosomes in humans and mice. There are also uh, very pronounced differences in mutation and recombination between different individuals. So here I'm showing you um, a plot of uh, mutation rates in four different humans, two males in blue and, and two females in green. And while there's some uncertainty in the precise point estimates here, uh, hopefully you can recognize that there are notable differences uh, between individuals. There are also differences in recombination among individuals. So some of my own prior work has demonstrated that males from two different mouse strains, a mouse strain called Cas, whoops, backwards, a mouse strain called Cas and a mouse strain called PWD, have these really notable differences in the overall frequency at which their chromosomes engage in this recombination-based shuffling. We also see differences in recombination and mutation across genomes. So here is a profile of, of mutation rate variation along chromosome one in humans. And here is a, a, a diagram showing variation in recombination rate across mouse chromosome 10. So hopefully you can appreciate here that there are very notable hot spots um, as well as cold spots for both of these processes across genomes. So what this means then is that certain regions of our genome are much more susceptible to uh, the accumulation of new mutations than other regions. And similarly, there are spots in our genomes that are much more likely to engage in this recombination-based uh, genomic shuffling than other regions. And lastly, we know that these two mechanisms of inheritance, mutation and recombination, vary with age. So in fathers, um, the uh, chromosomes of older dads accumulate more new mutations. This means that older dads transmit more mutations to their kids. And some recent work has even begun to uh, shed light on the fact that uh, the incidence of sporadic rare genetic diseases are increased in older fathers compared to younger fathers due to this very phenomenon. And older moms actually, the chromosomes of older moms actually undergo higher rates of this recombination-based reshuffling. So why is it then that there are um, differences in these overall uh, uh, frequencies of mutation and recombination uh, among individuals, among species, and across genomes? What uh, actually causes variation in the very mechanisms that are themselves responsible for uh, governing the process of inheritance? Um, and so my own research over the past couple of years has been specifically focused on uh, addressing why it is that different individuals um, uh, exhibit differences in their overall frequencies of mutation and recombination. And what our work has begun to shed light on is the fact that actually genetic differences among individuals can in turn encode for differences in the frequency at which their, their genomes engage in these diversity generating processes. So let's parse that out a little bit more. Mutation and recombination, which are of course these, the two processes that are responsible for generating all new variation within populations. Well, some subset of the new variants that these two processes generate in turn have the potential to actually influence the recombination frequency and the mutation frequency across genomes. So what this means then in effect is that different individuals within a population disproportionately contribute to the level of diversity within that population. So uh, the, the kind of pool of diversity that we see within a given population doesn't uniformly arise from all the members of that population. So mutation and recombination provide this, this constant influx of new diversity into populations, and together these two processes account for all of the variation that we see in the natural world, both variation among individuals as well as variation between species. 
But these processes themselves are incredibly variable, and they vary among individuals, they vary among species, and they vary across genomes. And uh, work underway in my lab, as well as laboratories across the world, is beginning to shed light on the ways in which um, some of this variation is actually subject to genetic control itself. So um, coming back to this very simple model of inheritance, so it's absolutely true. We each get one copy of, of each of our chromosomes from our mom, and one copy comes from dad. Um, but there's a lot of complexity hidden behind this uh, simple model. Um, and uh, I think that that complexity is really interesting and fascinating to study. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. So the question is, if mice are so different from humans, why are they used to study human diseases? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one, um, we have the ability to uh, mate mice however we want, which is not a luxury we have in humans. So we can, we can carry out genetic crosses um, that allow us to tackle the underlying genetics of diseases in a way that we simply can't do in humans. Secondly is that they have very short generation times, so that makes them amenable to studying in the lab. Humans, in contrast, you know, generation times are upward of 20, 30 years. So uh, you know, it's very hard to do genetic studies on humans for that simple reason. But the third reason is that, you know, although mice and humans differ in a number of ways, um, some core aspects of their physiology and biochemistry are remarkably well conserved between humans and mice. Um, and so mice get diabetes, for example. Mice get cancer. Mice get all of these diseases that commonly affect humans. Um, and so by studying them in this experimentally tractable model system, we have the ability to really kind of tackle and understand the biology behind these diseases. Genetic differences um, can in turn, so genes, uh, genetic differences that fall in genes. So genes um, encode for proteins, or most often encode for proteins as we know, and those proteins carry out important functions within a cell. So imagine you have a genetic variant that occurs um, that influences the ultimate structure or function of a particular protein. That in turn has the ability to um, kind of influence how that protein functions within the cell. And the outcome may be disease, it may be a uh, difference in hair color, it could be a difference in, in height. Um, but really these underlying genetic differences through their uh, uh, effects on, on proteins and, and subsequent steps um, in, in the biology of the cell have the ability to uh, influence outwardly visible traits. Mm -hmm.